to the last panel of our bridge conference. It's a high level debate on migration, populism and the future of Europe. And we're going to reflect on the state and the future of the EU in light of its current challenges, including the COVID-19. And I'm extremely pleased to welcome our two speakers who will shed light on these topics. Our first speaker will be Ambassador Ferdinando Nelly Barocchi, who is president of the Institute, Institute of International Affairs in Rome. He was formerly the permanent representative of Italy to the EU, as well as for a time also European Commissioner in charge of the industry portfolio. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation to speak today. Our second speaker is Professor uh, Michael Maduro. He is the founding director of the UI School of Transnational Governance. He is also the former Deputy Prime Minister of Portugal and a former ECJ Advocate General, as many of you probably know. And from 1st January, Portugal holds the rotating presidency of the Council of the EU. So we are especially pleased to have you with us today. I'm sure we're going to have some very inspiring input on the challenges facing the EU, but also the future of Europe and also average discussion afterwards. And my plan is that we first have the two presentations and then after that we can have a debate. And as you know from the other panels we have had together during these two past days, um, it will be possible to ask questions either by raising your, your virtual hand or by sending a mail to uh, Catherine or to me. So uh, I think we should just get started and I'll now pass on the floor to our first speaker, Ambassador Farrokhi. Thank you. Thank you, Elle, for your presentation and thanks to Federico Fabrini for the invitation to participate in this panel, concluding the Bridge Conference. Um, unfortunately, I was not able to participate in the previous panels, but I'm very glad to develop some considerations on the big questions over the future of Europe. Now, I think that, uh, Ella, you mentioned it, the main challenge for Europe, which is not only a challenge for Europe, it's to face COVID-19. Unfortunately, uh, we have to start from this. Europe, after China, was the first continent to be hit very seriously by COVID-19 in spring this year. And unfortunately, we are back again uh, in the middle of a second wave of COVID-19, which is very serious which was probably should have been anticipated, but it has not been uh, uh, sufficiently taken into consideration. So we were not prepared to the second wave of the uh, pandemic. Uh, we are again in the middle of a situation where governments are forced to adopt uh, lockdowns, sometimes partial, sometimes total lockdowns, uh, suspension of activities, um, serious limitations to mobility, uh, the, number of measures that we have seen during the spring, which have uh, dramatically affected not only our daily lives, but also our economies and our societies. Uh, many countries in Europe, probably all countries in Europe, are developing a vaccination campaign, but uh, we are in the middle of the pandemic and the prospects of this pandemic are not clear at all. We don't know yet when we, it will be over, when we'll be back, we will be able to be back to a certain degree of normality. Uh, despite this uncertainty, I think that there are a few lessons that can already be drawn from the pandemic. The first one it has to do with the health emergency that the pandemic has provoked. In Europe, uh, we were not prepared. Uh, not governments uh, or neither the uh, European institutions were prepared to face uh, such a pandemic. We were caught by surprise. Uh, at the beginning, governments reacted uh, with national measures in a rather disorderly and uncoordinated manner. Only after the experience of the first weeks of the pandemic, uh, we were able to develop some common uh, measures. Um, at the end of the first period, uh, one can draw the conclusion that the European Union has been able to develop a, a rather coordinated response, uh, even despite the fact that the EU does not have direct competences in the health sector. Uh, the lesson is that uh, when there is uh, political will or political determination, things can be done even without uh, revising the treaties. And this is what, for instance, the Commission 
is doing with the purchase of vaccines, uh, millions of vaccines from several producers that will be distributed to member countries according to a distribution key, which is based on the number of their populations. So I think this is important. It's not sufficient, but it's a positive development. I hope it will wish well for the future in the sense that uh, certainly there is need for Europe to develop a better resilience for future situation of this kind that cannot be uh, discarded. The second lesson uh, is to be drawn from the economic emergency. As I mentioned, the measures of uh, limitations to movement and suspension of uh, economic uh, activities has produced a, a terrible impact on our economies. A dramatic uh, fall in GDPs, uh, different from countries to countries, but altogether something about eight, nine percent as an average in Europe, a dramatic uh, reduction of industrial outputs and also uh, serious contractions of activities in the service sectors. By the way, in this particular area, the COVID has hit in a very differentiated manner in the sense that countries that are more dependent from the service sectors than others and be, have been hit more seriously. And just to mention uh, one sector in particular, which is tourism, which is affecting in particular the southern countries of Europe. National governments have adopted quite rapidly uh, national measures, which uh, already uh, during the spring, which had the uh, purpose and objective of containing uh, in the short run the consequences of the, the pandemic. And uh, even though adopted on a national basis, more or less they were convergent in their scope and also in their objectives. These measures have been, and there comes the EU, uh, were complemented and accompanied by uh, European measures, uh, which uh, on, on this occasion were taken and adopted by you in a very rapid and effective manner. The comparison with what happened which during the economic and financial crisis uh, is rather impressive. I mean, I don't have to list all those measures because they are well known. But what it's important to note is that this, on this occasion, the EU reacted rapidly and effectively and uh, on the basis of the uh, principle of solidarity. The most important of these measures, of course, is the next generation EU. Uh, no, no need to elaborate on this because uh, everybody knows what we're talking about, but I want to stress two elements of this program, which are, in my view, particularly meaningful. First is the volume of financial resources that NGEU is capable or will be capable of mobilizing in the next uh, three to five years, uh, something like 750 billion euros that will be added to the others programs that have already been adopted and will be adopted in the context of a regular EU budget. And the second, which is probably from the political point of view, even more important factor is the way this program will be funded. So through the emission of common bonds by the Commission guaranteed by the EU budget. Now, whether this uh, important innovation will remain in a one-shot measure, or whether it will be the beginning of the new phase for economic governance, the view, we, we shall see. I would say a few words later on. And the third challenge has to do with the social impact of the COVID. We have uh, witnessed a dramatic uh, impact uh, of COVID on level of employment, of unemployment, and also in the widening of the differences and divergences in wealth distribution uh, with the least, uh, with the least uh, strong sectors of our societies being hit uh, more seriously than others. So the, they, they think differences have widened in our societies. Um, all measures that will have to be taken both at national level and the EU level will have to consider the need to um, contain the social impact, the dramatic social impact of uh, COVID. So they should have to be inclusive. Uh, they should be possibly adopted uh, in the context of a social dialogue with the social partners and should aim at uh, reducing inequalities and differences in the distribution of wealth. Now, uh, 
let's see uh, the situation that we're facing now uh, and what are the challenges for the future. And I will be very concrete and try to concentrate more on policies than on institutions. First, the first challenge is that we are still in the middle of COVID. COVID remains the major threat for Europe. Uh, we are, as I said, in the middle of a situation it was not uh, foreseen, uh, which has forced governments uh, to adopt uh, measures of uh, reduction of uh, movement, uh, limitations to, fit to mobility, suspension of activities, and the impact of our economy will be uh, much stronger than anticipated. The first forecast for 2021 were predicting uh, a relaunch of our economy. And I don't know whether this uh, forecast uh, will be confirmed based on what's happening in the first weeks and months of this year. There, there are no uh, positive perspectives for our economies, <clears throat> despite what uh, has been deployed, both at national and uh, European uh, level. Europe will have to concentrate its efforts on the uh, containment of contagions, the need to reduce hospitalization, and also the need to strengthen the sanitary sectors in all countries. Uh, in the hope that vaccine, vaccines will produce the results as soon as possible. But for the time being, this is the first uh, challenge. Second challenge, uh, which has to do more with the title of this panel is the challenge of nationalism and populism. Even though uh, we have uh, seen in Europe in particular, a certain uh, de decrease of um, consensus for nationalist and populist movements, also, let's say, as a result of the measures and decisions taken by the European Union, which is normally a target of nationalist and populist movements, uh, nationalism and populism, sovereignism remain uh, a threat uh, uh, in Europe. Not only in Europe, as we have seen, the uh, situation is particularly worrying in the United States, despite the success of Biden, because the number of votes for Trump at the presidential election was impressive, and Trumpism remains, unfortunately, a reality in American society. And also, it has to be noted, that the pandemic has demonstrated the resilience of autocratic regimes. The lessons that come from China, from Russia, from Turkey, is that um, countries where there is no that sort of democracy that we consider as such are performing better than others, uh, more democratic regime, both in the efforts to contain the pandemic and also in their efforts to relaunch their economies. And this is something which is a com comparative disadvantage for Western democracies that we will have to take into account. So there is a need for governments, institutions, for all those who have responsibilities to maintain a high level of vigilance on this phenomenon. There is no easy lessons to be drawn, neither easy recipes to address the problem, but uh, the, more, the more we will all collectively be able to respond to the expectations of our citizens, the more we will be able to face our challenges with the existing institutions or reformed institutions, both at national and at European level, the more we will be able to contain the phenomenon of populism and, and sovereignism. Now, more specifically, if we look at the uh, future of economic governance uh, in Europe, uh, again, a uh, few considerations that are linked to the next generation EU. Next generation EU, as I said, uh, has been an important accomplishment so far. It still has to be implemented for the uh, amount of resources that it will be able to mobilize. But now we are in a situation where the member countries, which will be the beneficiaries of this program, will have to show and to demonstrate they are capable of implementing their own national recovery plan in a, an efficient manner, consistent with the objectives that were decided in common at the European Union level. It's a, it's a complex task. Uh, governments are working on this. Some are more successful and more rapid than others. But the success of the next generation EU will be the success of Europe. So it's a challenge for all. 
national governments and European institutions, those institutions at the European level, which will have the task of monitoring these national plans, controlling that they will respond to the common objectives and also uh, controlling that their implementation is consistent with the rules of the games that have been decided collectively. But as I said, uh, Next Generation EU has also set an important precedent. The idea of funding uh, a program of this dimension through the emission of common bonds by the Commission and with guarantee by the budget of the Union may, uh, and I'm very prudent of this, open the way for a further debate, developments over the possibility of an autonomous uh, Eurozone budget, possibly with a stabilizing stabilization function. It's a very controversial question. There is no agreement that I'm aware of so far in the EU institutions, in particular in the Council, but we are in the presence of an important innovation which may change the overall scenario. Second question, which will also will have to be addressed very soon, is the reform of the rules, of the existing rules on fiscal discipline. We know that uh, by the summer, probably by next fall, the Commission will present some proposals on how to review, reform the Stability Pact. Uh, this has been requested by many. Others are very prudent on this, we know. It's going to be very controversial. But in a situation where the level of public debts of all member countries have raised uh, to such a spectacular level, is it still reasonable to consider that the existing rules are wise, sufficient, uh, flexible, or they can be reformed? So this is another big question. More generally, few indications on what, uh, on what the EU should concentrate. Uh, migration has been a subject of an intense debate in your conference so far, I will be very brief. Personally, I think that on this particular policy areas, the uh, EU response is still not uh, satisfactory. There is a lot that can be done to improve the performance of the EU on migrations. There is a lot that can be done to develop a comprehensive policy on migration based on few principles on which, in theory, all could agree. A, a more efficient control of our external borders, an asylum policy based uh, on the principle of solidarity, common program of repatriation or at least repatriation conducted nationally by the support of the European Union, means and instruments, but also more effective management of legal migrations, which are very important, even though, even I would say is essential for our labor market. On trade, uh, the EU has already an agenda for trade liberalization. It should continue with this agenda, should pursue it. It should not only be free trade, it should also be fair trade. In the past, we have learned that some decisions taken in this area have provoked reactions, uh, not, not positive reactions, from people that felt excluded by these trade liberalization initiatives. But also the EU should concentrate on the need to reform seriously and effectively the uh, in international institutions, which is at the head of the uh, trade liberalization the trade regime, which is WTO. On climate and energy transition, the EU has already decided a number of very important uh, targets. Now the main problem for us will be to convince others to follow the example. We should not be, we should not remain isolated, otherwise we will pay an excessively high price. And then the EU should also develop a industrial policy, which will have as an, its main objective, that of increasing the competitiveness of the European Union industry through more investment on education, research and innovation, through new rules on competition and state aids, through more investment on, on digital and, and in the realization of the digital market. And finally, very last remark, and I will stop here. We have an agenda for strategic autonomy. So far, this uh, has remained a rather empty concept. We should try to translate it uh, into something concrete and implementable, bearing in mind through proviso, first, that this agenda should be implemented in close collaboration with our American friends. Now it, it will be easier with Biden at the White House than before. <clears throat> and that second element, uh, strategic autonomy does not only mean autonomy in the field of defense and security. 
It means autonomy in many other policy areas, trade, energy, digital um, development uh, of emerging technologies where Europe can implement its own agenda. <coughs> Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for this very, very rich presentation <coughs> with all your many visions for the future of the EU. We don't have much time, so I just pass on the floor directly to Professor Maduro, please. Thank you, so, thank you so much. Uh, so I think we all uh, will agree that this pandemic is perhaps the challenge of our lifetime. Um, it is a challenge, that is a health challenge that involves matter, issues of life and death, but it's also a much broader challenge regarding how we live and uh, organize ourselves in political and economic terms. Uh, and this includes uh, on our relation with the European Union and on within the European Union itself. Uh, let me start to stress the importance of the challenge that we face and what we can learn from what has happened so far with the metaphor that I borrow from a book that I recently co-edited with Paul Kahn and it's called Democracy in Times of Pandemic. And it's a way for me to also advertise my, my book. So uh, the best apocalyptic movies, I think we, we've, we've all seen that, you've all seen that from Mad Max to The Stalker. If you notice that those apocalyptic movie, movies, they are much less about the apocalypse itself than what follows it. In other words, they focus on the systemic changes that are triggered by the apocalypse. Um, uh, disaster creates the conditions for political change. Uh, and this is what we are seeing with this pandemic. On the other hand, facts alone, uh, even terrible facts, do not themselves and by themselves determine what comes next. And if that will be bad or good. Uh, and it will depend a lot on the reaction that we will have to those facts, including the European Union reaction. We all know that the pandemic, the COVID-19 health emergency, uh, was initially uh, a health issue um, where the European Union has limited competences. Uh, but managing this health emergency uh, already raises deeper issues about democratic governance in Europe, in its member states, and with regard to the European Union itself. Uh, issues arise, for example, at the interface of expertise and democratic authority. Uh, we were all well aware that many populist movies, many populist uh, leaders uh, actually made as one of their uh, leading themes uh, the objection, the opposition to the idea of governance by expertise, to the idea since those experts were perceived as part of the elites and a core aspect of populism is the opposition to elites. Uh, in some respects, the pandemic has brought in, uh, a renewed true trust on experts and support at the same time for political authority. Uh, this is normal, is well known as what the Americans call rallying behind the flag in moments where of emergency where people look for reassurance and stability. As the pandemic has progressed, however, and it has progressed without a clear solution, uh, science has increasingly became contested, expertise has again been uh, put in tension with democratic accountability. The European Union is a place where expertise dominates uh, and therefore is and will be at the center of this tension and ought to take seriously both this challenge but also the opportunity it offers it. For example, uh, uh, even in areas that relate to the management of the health, uh, the health emergency. Um, the Center uh, for Disease Control, comparative data and many other data that we have seen has promoted, for example, forms of governance through indicators and comparison between public policies. But at the same time, we have seen, for example, uh, from the initial praises on the European Union vaccine approach to increasing criticism, for example, on uh, the delay 
of the vaccination process in the European Union compared, I'm not even talking about Israel, compared with the United Kingdom. And the fact that the European Medical Agency seems to take much longer time than, for example, its UK counterpart. And no doubt that many people and many populists are, will be likely to use this, uh, uh, stressing the advantages of Brexit, for example. The pandemic is also creating a, a, a social and economic emergency. Uh, uh, and the response to this economic emergency and to the crisis that uh, is at its origin, as uh, pit claims of nationalism and protectionism against claims of integration, uh, globalization and free trade. Some claim even that this current uh, crisis might may again redefine the nature of the relationship between the state, public authority and the market, and even the foundations of our social contracts. The European Union is, and it will be at the center of all this challenge. So far, the European Union approach has been twofold. Uh, on the one hand, a substantial program of economic assistance and recovery. Uh, this is, on the one hand, a temporary, a significant uh, program, but temporary in nature, but also, as it was said already, uh, uh, opens the door to structural transformations. Uh, the, it's not the first time that the European Union issues debt, but it's the first time that issues debt with such scale and basically as an instrument to uh, uh, expand what is the budget of the European Union. But, and at the same time, it does so by opening the door to new own resources, to a new form of financing of the European Union that will be less dependent on trust funds from national budgets and more reliant on genuine own resources that would tax economic activity at the European Union level, likely Euro economic activity that states by themselves can no longer effectively tax. So it is an opportunity, not only in economic terms, but it is an opportun opportunity to redesign the policies and to politically change the union. At the same time, this uh, program also raises the prospect of changes on the nature of conditionality that has always been present in the European Union and with respect to EU policies. Uh, because, uh, for example, it extends the issues on which conditionality could be used, that is, on the way the European Union can condition transfer of resources to its member states on particular issues, for example, now extending this to matters of the rule of law. But it also is, uh, uh, and we will have to see the extent to which that will affect old pillars. In the new pillars, in the uh, um, next generation, for example, reintroducing and inter or intergovernmentalizing the, uh, uh, further the process of conditionality, because while in the old uh, uh, EU funds, the conditionality was agreed between the Commission and the member states in the new fund, such conditionality is much more similar to macroeconomic conditionality, will be subject to an agreement in the Council. Uh, uh, it would also be interesting to see the extent to which this conditionality will be, will continue to be, in my view, wrongly, this is something that we can debate, focus on policies, or if it, instead it should be more focused on, on promoting institutional changes at the level of the member states, on promoting, on using EU structural funds to change and reinforce institutions at the level of the member states. A second uh, 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 arm of the changes introduced by the European Union was the suspension of the enforcement of fiscal discipline and in part state aid rules. This is on the one hand perceived as giving leeway to member states but on the other hand, also risks increase the symmetry and the, and the promotion of economic diversions. This is so because while uh, the shock that is brought by the pandemic is to a certain extent a symmetric shock, shock, the virus exists and the pandemic presents itself in all states, its impact is strongly 
asymmetric because it depends on the different economic structures in different states and also on the different capacity of states to answer to those challenges in a different way. So we know, for example, that Germany has been responsible for almost half of the state aid that has been given during this period. That means that that stronger capacity to support its companies also represents and risks uh, uh, distorting competition within the internal market and aggravating, for example, economic divergence. Now, it is very much still in the open, how will the European Union effectively manage these tensions and the possible conflicts that result from them? And therefore, how the European Union will emerge in general terms from this crisis. If it will emerge as stronger and more cohesive, or are more eroded and more divergent. This is also linked to the ethical emergence, emergency that is brought by the pandemic. We will have to decide, we are already deciding difficult questions regarding redistribution and privacy, for example. To whom do, they, do we have a duty of care? Who should we vaccinate first? What are our obligations towards the worst of at home and abroad? And the same thing regarding issues of freedom and privacy that have been raised already during this pandemic. These questions express multiple compelling issues. Some of these issues may be transformative of democracy in Europe, others may either amplify or limit ongoing transformations of democracy. Some may highlight the, par the parameters and confines of democracy, while others may expand them. Uh, if one is to be honest, we have to say that it's hard to anticipate how much what is going on in democracy in times of pandemic is going to impact democracy after the pandemic. But something, in my view, is crucial. We need to discuss this. Uh, um, and one first issue that I think we'll all agree results from the way uh, uh, our political systems address the pandemic is why were we not prepared. Uh, uh, this highlights, uh, we all knew that there have been many warnings regarding the pandemic and yet we were not prepared. Moreover, we have seen the extent to which we remain to continue not to be sufficiently prepared for the second wave and for what is now the third wave of the pandemic. This highlights to a large extent that governments, our political systems, have severe problems in integrating potential risks, future risks into public policy decisions. Um, uh, this is in part because of the difficulty of incorporating science and expertise into policy making, but this is also due, due to a strong asymmetry between the costs and the risks uh, inherent in future and hypothetical events and the costs involved in preventing them today. Um, and, 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 and this is something that we see uh, not only with respect to pandemics, but should alert us to many other issues that are dominant in our democracies today. Issues of intergenerational justice, debt leg legacy, or climate change. The pandemic is a particular viable, a particular uh, 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 visible example of the extent to which our political systems are increasingly incapable of incorporating many of the risks, many of the costs that because they are hypothetical of future, uh, um, uh, therefore do not shape our policy decisions today. Now the European Union has traditionally played a very strong role in introducing into the political system mechanisms forcing the internalization of interests that are either uh, uh, sub-represented, sub-accounted for in political systems, or there are simply future risks that the political systems do not sufficiently take into account. In my view, this should again be a priority in the development of future EU policies and decisions. The role that it can play in correcting this malfunction at the level of national political systems. Uh, uh, this, at the same time, and on the other hand, also reinforces questions on the democratic role and the accountability of experts in science. The pandemic exposes a series of issues concerning the role of science and experts in democratic decision-making. 
In, in times of uncertainty, citizens are more willing to rely on authority, including scientific authority. They turn to whom they believe knows how to protect them. And politicians also rely on scientists, on experts to legitimate their decisions. Expertise, whose role in democracy was being heavily criticized before this pandemic, seems in the, in the initial, seemed in the initial stage of the pandemic to have been reevaluated and empowered by the crisis. But this has become increasingly problematic when and as experts can't offer the certainty we were looking for. This was already made clear by failures of communication across the divide separating ordinary people from experts. For example, attempts at to create social distancing through less severe forms of lockdown seem to be failing everywhere. The re these recommendations do not work because there is a mismatch between that which determines public support, evidence people can see, and the scientific lit literacy necessary to understand public risks, evidence to be reasoned with. Democratic politics works well with the first, but not with the second. The problem is not unique to public health recommendations, however. It teaches us a broader lesson about politics that explains much of what we have been witnessing. It appears in multiple dimensions of the exercise of the vote. Voters decide on what they feel and not on the actual grounds of, pol of public policy. The EU can be an instrument to bring rationality back into democratic politics, but can equally be a victim of it. Much in this uh, respect will depend on what the European Union will actually, will actually deliver. The economic consequences of the pandemic, as I said, will be profoundly asymmetric among countries and social groups. All will be worse off, some will be much worse off. Uh, the pandemic in this respect will put even under a stronger stress our social contract. Now, the European Union can be an instrument to help reinstate, to help protect such social contract. It can do so because, for example, it can reinstate tax, ju tax justice where states can no longer guarantee such ta tax justice. Or it can be bring back under public scrutiny and regulation areas of economic activities whose transnational dimension makes them, for, makes for them to be easy to avoid the borders of national regulation. As, as such, the impact of the pandemic on democracy in Europe can be either positive or negative. Pessimists, and I will conclude with that, pessimists point to three different risks. First, there is a possible perception that authoritarian regimes are more effective in addressing the crisis, which will undermine trust in democratic leadership. Second, there is a well-grounded fear that populists will use the extraordinary powers necessary to address certain aspects of this crisis to further erode the principles of liberal democracy. Third, there is a fear of a resurgence of nationalism as some politicians blame other nations and immigrants for the pandemic. We have seen the three in action in this crisis and often together. The democratic culture has become in some states that of a state of emergency. But this is an almost natural evolution from a democratic culture that has increasingly been narrowed down to simply counting heads. Democracy has been increasingly confused with majoritarian voting. It has been stripped of its other constitutional pillars. The obliteration of checks and balances and political pluralism from dominant and popular accounts of democracy has opened the door to populism. The pandemic has just pushed many through that door. To reconnect democracy with political pluralisms and checks and balances must be a priority. To understand the role that the EU can play in that respect is equally important. But there's also an optimistic view. Optimism must be based on the renewed awareness of our relational nature and the bounds of solidarity that re-emerged during the pandemic, including at the European level. It will also stress how the pandemic called upon our democratic and civic duties as on our rights. 
has made clear to us that to be citizens, including European citizens, involves duties and not only rights. It will also emphasize the increased support for political elites and the editors of our democracy from media to experts. The renewed support and trust in scientific expertise that we have seen during certain periods of the pandemic can open new paths for a more rational and epistemologically sound democratic engagement. All these are opportunities in my view for the European Union to ultimately win the public opinion battle that is currently taking place nationally, European and internationally. For the European Union to play a decisive role, not in, in eroding national democracies, but instead in bringing back into the democracy, reason, pluralism and liberal constitutionalism. Thank you. Thank you so much for this very inspiring uh, presentation on uh, COVID-19 and democracy, and of course the future of the EU. Um, that was very, very interesting. We don't have a lot of time. We have approximately 15 minutes left and we already have some questions from the audience. So I am going to pass on the floor to our first question and that's from uh, Dennis McShane. Could we allow him to have his speaker on? Thank you who is former Europe Minister of the United Kingdom, for those who don't know him, of course. Yes, hello, can you hear or see me? I, I, I've got an odd screen. You are seen and we I hear see you. you. Okay, fine, well, no problem. No, look, I, I just wanted to make a tiny point on this last very interesting point, uh, where I think the EU has, frankly, not really lived up to its billing, and that is health, is exclusively a national prerogative, always very jealously guarded. And I, living in England, having seen Mr. Johnson have the highest level of COVID mortalities, uh, no test or tracing that's of any v validity, uh, real problems with uh, providing uh, personal protection equipment, and yet, we are doing vaccinations at, I think we've vaccinated more people than all the main European Union member states together. Now, why is this? Why is France, Germany, Italy so backward? And should the, because Mrs. Mrs. von der Leyen or President Michel can't order Mr. Macron or, or Mrs. Merkel what to do on health. But why is there no urgency to show the world not only we are vaccinating faster, because some of the vaccines have been developed here in, 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 in Europe, we're also vaccinating uh, foreigners within our borders, vaccinating refugees, vaccinating the poor people. This has been a real, you know, I just think of political symbolism, a real failure at the highest level of Brussels to grab vaccination and treat it like a Normandy landing and throw everything at it and show the world Europe can lead. Thank you very much for this interesting question. And please, our two speakers who would like to reply. Perhaps Ambassador Ferdinand should start first and then me. I don't know, as, as you prefer, Ambassador. <laughs> well, uh, there is an easy answer to the question which has been posed by Dennis McShane, um, I'm glad to see he, I remember him when he was a minister for European Affairs uh, some time ago. Uh, and the easy answer is that the uh, British uh, medical agency has been much faster than the European one in authorizing the beginning of vaccinations in the UK. Uh, the European Medical Medicine Agency has accumulated the delay of some weeks and so most of uh, the European countries outside the UK have started their campaign with some delay with, if compared to the UK. Then there may be other reasons. Um, not all countries are equipped or have, have been equipped, are still in the process of being prepared for conducting such a campaign, which is going to be unique in the history of uh, mankind. Never in the past, to my knowledge, such a huge vaccination campaign is being conducted in such a, a short period of time because it has to be very fast. But I'm not an expert on vaccines, so I, 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 I would stop here. 
Yeah, and Professor so, Medical, please. So I think that the, uh, um, partly is the division of competences, uh, partly is the the um, the predominant uh, risk assessment culture between the European continent and the UK. And let me explain why. So uh, there is a, a, a EU responsibility in this, in this, the ambassador already mentioned, the, uh, the European Medical Agency has been slower in approving medicines with the exception of the Moderna vaccine. It's been slower in approving the, the Pfizer me medicine and particularly the Oxford uh, the med med, uh, vaccine uh, that will be crucial in uh, exponentially growing the vaccination capacity. So I don't know. And I find it very hard. I think part of it has to do with the, the uh, aversion to risk. Uh, the European Union has uh, um, transferred the liability, has uh, left the liability for the vaccines in the pharmaceutical companies. The UK has decided basically that the state will assume that liability itself. And therefore that al has allowed a much faster approval process. Uh, um, it's two different, uh, I mean, no positions of assess which one is better or not overall, uh, but it's clear that the UK one provides a much quicker answer and, uh, and, and agreement uh, and decision. But is, I also find it hard to be said, the kind of almost bureaucratic approach of the European Medical Agency. I mean, when I see an agency in a context just as this, saying that in, 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 uh, in one month and a half, in the, in the, like they said in December, that on the 10th, 28th of January, they will meet to decide on the, on the Oxford vaccine. I mean, I think citizens are very, it's very hard for citizens to understand this because the, uh, either they are ready and then they should decide that day or they shouldn't say in, in four weeks we have a meeting, that's the meeting we are going to decide on the vaccine. That's completely, so there's a, a severe problem of communication there uh, uh, that they ought to address. And then there is a responsibility that lies with the member states, uh, 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 with the individual member states, because we see strong variation between the member states too. I mean, we, I think the UK, already vaccines uh, uh, 40 persons uh, um, per uh, 100,000, something like that, has already vaccinated. And the second one in Europe is, I think, Denmark with 20. Uh, and then you have countries in Europe that, that have less than one uh, per 100,000. So extreme variation, and that's a resp an individual responsibility of member states. But I, I, I think that uh, it will be very hard for the European Union to take over those competences. And certainly the, the, it will have been impossible in such a short period to change and amend the EU competences to make the Union responsible for that. Thank you very much for, for an interesting question and from some good replies. We have one more question and that question comes from David Q. So could we give the floor to him? We have David with us, or did he leave? Let's just see. Okay, it's, it actually looks like maybe he left us, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask his question then. <laughs> so basically what David asks is when sort of nationalism, or should we call it the love of one's own nation, when that is a healthy thing, a productive thing, a positive thing, or when it, and when does it then become a, a, a not very productive thing, a negative thing? He says, I would like to ask what is the main problem or criticism with nationalism? A nation's identity based on culture, traditions, language, history, etc., are important and should be upheld. Nationalism was behind Ireland gaining independence from Britain, the dissolution of the USSR, etc. It shouldn't necessarily be conflated with hatred of others. Could we have some, some comments on this from our two speakers, please? A very classical question, I would say, yeah. So Maduro, it's up to you now to begin. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> so I think the, the problem is not with being patriotic. That's a, 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 the problem is when patriotism turns into nationalism and nationalism is understood uh, as being as 
uh, versus the others becomes a, a, a limit uh, to the inclusion of the others to take into account the values and the interests uh, that are represented by those others and to the advantages that we have from interdependence. I think that that is, that is the problem with nationalism is not the elements of patriotism that is mentioned in that respect. I think we all, a healthy dose of patriotism is very necessary for everybody and it's part of our identity. Uh, uh, but often, as we have seen in the past, uh, uh, um, nationalism has become uh, uh, an instrument um, uh, of uh, opposition against the others, of constructing uh, wrongly, in my view, uh, our interests as being opposed to those of the others uh, uh, and constructing the protection of our interests as having to be done at the expense of the others. And if I, I think that if there's something that this pandemic shows to us at the level of our family, at the level of our community, local community, at the level of our states, at the level of our world, is that our own well-being depends on the well-being of the others. And I hope that we will preserve that uh, relational lesson that results from the pandemic. Thank you. A very nice reply. I'm sorry you left. Would have been so good to just hear one, that. Just one, Nando, uh, just one small comment, because maybe I have been at the origin of this uh, question, because I utilized in a rather simplistic manner the term nationalism. Of course, what I had in mind is the pathology of nationalism. When nationalism becomes a, an act of faith which uh, denies the validity of international cooperation, which denies the importance of the rules of the games uh, in the international arena, when it becomes uh, an element of destruction of the multilateral system, for instance, on which uh, our certainties were based so far and on which, by the way, the European Union was able to develop itself. This was the sort of nationalism that I had in mind. Uh, the translation may be clear to understand of this term would be Trumpism, just to be clear. So this is what I exactly had in mind. And sorry for so the much. misunderstanding that I created. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, I think I agree. So when it becomes a threat to minorities and democracy as such, then, then it, it, it becomes a problem. And then I have a question from Federico. I think we have just time for one more question, Federico. Thanks a lot, Helen. And thanks to both the speaker for a fascinating presentation. I'm really grateful you brought in the COVID-19 uh, dimension to our discussion. That was exactly the idea of this high level debate to sort of broaden up. Uh, but if I can ask you, uh, it's, it's a question for both of you. Uh, I think, you know, when we launched the bridge project, we had four crises to look at, the Euro crisis, the migration crisis, Brexit, and the rule of law crisis. And then COVID-19 exploded a fifth crisis on top of everything else. Uh, and I fully agree with what you said, uh, that COVID is transformational. But one point that has emerged a lot in our conversation yesterday and, and this morning is how, in fact, uh, the migration crisis is the only one that is not touched by, by COVID or, or at least not in the same way as being a new momentum forward. For the Euro crisis, we, you both have mentioned next generation EU, which is a big change on the rule of law. Again, COVID was, uh, had a big impact uh, and same, same with Brexit. But why isn't uh, uh, the same happening in the field of improving the European uh, architecture of, of migration management. And then maybe just a small question to, uh, to Miguel, uh, because he, he is uh, in Portugal and Portugal has the uh, presidency of the Council of the European Union for these six months. Do you know of any plans to launch the Conference of the Future of Europe? That's probably the only thing the Germans didn't manage to do in their presidency. And many think this could be a moment to relaunch democracy to which you've been speaking about. So if you have any insights, on the plans of the presidency there will be helpful. So I, I can go first to leave the ambassador the final word. I think it's only a, a appropriate in terms of ranking too. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, a retired, uh, I'm a retired ambassador. Never mind. I'm a private once ambassador, 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 once ambassador, <laughs> ambassador forever. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so 
and I will answer on the question of the of the Portuguese presidency and the conference on the future of Europe. Uh, uh, I've heard of many plans, not only and not even mostly in the context of the European presidency, uh, but I've heard of nothing concrete. So far as I know, there's been a lot of discussions. There's been a strong disagreement, for example, on the name or names that ought to coordinate such process, on the representation of the different institutions, uh, and also on the mandate of such conference. There's a clear division between those that believe that it should be, uh, if you want to put it very pragmatic, uh, it should not try to be put forward a, a bold vision for the future and the bold reform of the European Union, but should focus on what is feasible on the short term and, and, and basically uh, making small fine-tuning amendments for the European Union that may not, nevertheless have important impact and significant impact in the future. And there's others uh, that defend a much bolder mandate for such a conference on the future of Europe, almost uh, like the mandate that was given to the previous conference on the future of Europe. I think that that issue will not depend on the presidency of, of Portugal. In fact, I think we all know that nowadays the role, the importance of the presidencies is uh, limited, uh, perhaps less when you're talking about a country such as Germany, uh, uh, but otherwise the presidencies nowadays don't have the same uh, um, leadership, leadership and driving tools that they had before. The Portuguese government, I think, will be mostly focused on two things. Uh, uh, one, uh, that is to be able to try to uh, have a smooth and expedient approval of the national reform plans uh, that will be crucial for the disbursement of the funds of the Next Generation Europe program of the economic recovery. And, and Portugal, as you can imagine, is particularly interested uh, on, on that. Uh, um, and so I think that they will try to do that. Uh, uh, the extent to which they will yes. be successful is unclear. I think a lot was left open for that. Uh, as I said, uh, for the first time, you will need these programs to be approved by qualified majority. Uh, 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 I suspect that we may have a very strong debate in the council on the kind of conditionality that could be attached to these programs. Uh, you will certainly have Portugal uh, uh, trying to minimize that conditionality in the areas of macroeconomic. And I think this is explains why many people didn't understood why, Portuguese, why the Portuguese government was particularly sympathetic towards Poland and Hungary when they were opposing the conditionality on the rule of law and why the Dutch government, on the other hand, was the stricter of governments on conditionality on the rule of law. It was not only about conditionality on the rule of law, they were already thinking about the precedent for conditionality on economic reform policies linked to these plans. My own position is that the European Union should focus much more on institutional reforms and institutional requirements. For example, I think it will be much more, instead of uh, agreeing on specific policies, that then the union doesn't have the mechanisms to effectively monitor and enforce, so it's window dressing, as it has been throughout the history of structural funds in that respect. It should focus much more, for example, on requiring, on, on imposing conditions that will require, for example, that the institutions that monitor the, at the national level, the outcomes produced by the projects and the assess the projects and evaluate and rank, and rank the projects, that they will be independent uh, um, from political bodies, for example. I think that will be a much more interesting way of approaching conditionality. Uh, I doubt that will be the case because it's not a tradition, but uh, I think that that, uh, that could be. The second aspect of the, European, of the Portuguese presidency will be the European Social Summit. Uh, the Portuguese presidency has made of that a very important flag. I know all of us that know well the European Union approach uh, European social summits with a, a, a reasonable do dose of skepticism, if not cynicism, because we have all seen multiple declarations of social rights at the European level. And at the same time, we all know that the European Union has very limited competences uh, to either enforce, monitor, or promote those social rights. Uh, in my view, it will be much more interesting 
if the if the such summit will focus, for example, on developing a EU strategy for a new area such as social innovation and impact investment, where the European Union could indeed do something. Thank you. And Ambassador, please. Well, on, on just one comment on, on the conference, because I have a personal opinion on this that I would like to uh, describe to you briefly. I am rather skeptical uh, over this initiative and I have a very strong fear is that such a conference, uh, if ever it would be launched, could become a, an arena for a confrontation between opposing views over the future of Europe. It, it could be very difficult to realize a convergence uh, on very problematic issues on which we all know that uh, member states, national governments, but even more so national opinions are deeply divided. Uh, again, it's a personal opinion. It could also be an opportunity to involve public opinions in a large debate, but the risk of letting emerge more divergences than convergences is there. And I think we should handle this conference with great care. Now there is another, the other interesting question which was posed by Federico is why migrations apparently or the management of migratory flows apparently have not been affected directly by the COVID crisis. At least this is what has clearly appeared from our presentation. There was very little room dedicated to migrations in both our interventions. I am uh, of the opinion that migration is a structural problem, but unfortunately the attention on migration and migratory policy is raised whenever there is an emergency. And to a certain extent, uh, this emergency has, has not been there during the COVID uh, period. Now, for instance, we are faced with dramatic images from Bosnia of people trying to cross Bosnia to reach the rest of Europe. But this is an episode, terrible, horrible, but altogether, uh, probably also as a consequence of COVID, there have been less migrants arriving into Europe during this period. And this has, uh, to a certain extent, decreased the uh, pressure on uh, governments and public uh, and, and European institutions uh, to, to deal with the migration as a, a very urgent issue, which I think should be the case. Because migration will remain as a structural problem uh, for EU Europe that will have to be dealt with, with more cooperation among Europeans, with more solidarity and with a more consistent and coherent common policy. Thank you so much. I'm afraid that time is running out. Course, unfortunately, I think our two presentations were so rich that we could have debated for maybe one hour more. So we'll have to do this again soon. But uh, for today, I have to say thank you. Thank you so much warmly to both our speakers. Thank you so much to the audience. And of course, thank you so much Federico for, for always being such a good leader of this project. Um, I don't know whether you would like to say a few words. No, just to invite people to our next conference in Copenhagen under your leadership in a few months' time. So we will be in touch. Stay tuned uh, and see you very soon. Yeah, see you thank soon you, in Copenhagen. Thank you for the thank invitation. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Good Bye. afternoon. Bye. Have a good weekend to all participants. Thank to you. To all of you. Yes. And stay safe. Wherever, you, wherever you are. Grazie, Ferdinando. Thanks, Miguel. Stay safe. Thank you, Federico. Thank you, Miguel.